So now I want to answer the question like, why not use acid for everything? I mean, it's so perfect, it's so consistent, and it's so amazing, as I've told you in so many previous lectures. Why did we even look at uh, acid? I mean, look at base. And the, the key is, is that it was difficult to scale databases. And so there's a couple of different ways to scale databases, and we'll go through them. One is uh, what we call vertical scaling, and that's just throwing more hardware at the problem more drives, more spinning disks, more channels, more, you know, more external ports. If you have one port and 50 disks, it doesn't do you any good, but if you have 50 ports and 50 disks, um, things like RAID arrays, like RAID 0 and RAID 1, the idea was to just find ways to increase the simultaneous bandwidth that we could get from disk drives, and, and mostly because of what databases are doing is scanning and discarding data to produce a small data set to give you back. A uh, small result set to give you back more CPUs and more memory. So the more you can keep of your database in cache and uh, acid style databases are great at using memory very well. So you start with you know 8 gig, then 16 gig, then 32 gig, and 64 gig, and, and everything's better until you then hit that new limit. So you just like that was great and we're super fast. Oh wait a sec, it's a year later or six months later, and now you need 128. So you can't. You can't just throw more disk drives, more processors, and more memory. And especially in you know, 2010, 2011, as we were moving from buying our own expensive hardware to virtualization, it was really difficult to virtualize like large memory and many processors. And so we tended to virtualize small boxes. So if you wanted a big box with you know, eight CPUs and 32 gig of RAM because you needed it, you tended to have to do something like either buy it and put it somewhere, lease space, or you had to lease it. And you had to make like a three-year commitment because that was a pretty expensive, you know, $40,000 piece of hardware. And you needed that hardware because your database. Another thing for vertical scaling that, you know, there was a couple of years where, how do you do your database tuning? Well, I switched to solid state disk drives and like, I'm a genius. And the answer is, yeah, you, that, that was a genius move for a while. And actually, SSDs, when, when they first came out, were great because their random access from place to place is fixed because um, they don't have to have a rotational delay like uh, disk drives do. Um, but then it got even better because now if you're actually reading a bunch of tiny little blocks, you can actually send a thing to an SSD that says, and so like a scatter gather, you're like, Read this, 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 here's 32 blocks I want you to read, read them all, and then just tell me when you got them. And then pew, 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 they just start coming back at you. And vertical scaling has been great. Um, but, but vertical scaling is never enough, right? We, we never have enough. And so we've got to find ways to tune. And so one of the classic ways of tuning a relational database is to add what are called read-only replicas. And you, you basically have a, some kind of software, maybe even the database itself, that looks at each, each of the SQL statements. Some of them are not making any changes to data, and some of them are. So an insert or an update or a begin transaction or something like that. And you look at that and you go, oh, ooh, ooh, we're going to have one master database, and that's a traditional vertically scaled database. We make it as fast as we can, and we're going to take transactions that either are going to require uh, statements that require transaction or are going to change the database and we wrote, write, wrote that to the master database server and then as changes are made it spews out a transaction log. Transaction logs are how databases are um, ensure that changes are made. They write it to the transaction log then they write it to the actual database and if something blows up in the middle they go back and look at the transaction log and they reapply. That's what transaction logs are for. But <clears throat> You can have a number of other servers that are watching those transaction logs and then having a replica of the database and then every time they see a transaction, then they add it to the replica. And so this actually is kind of base-like eventual consistency. Now, you know, these are, these are delayed by maybe a quarter of a second or even less depending on how awesome they are and how fast the network is and how fast the servers are. So you could think of this as a adding sort of base-like read stuff to a an otherwise acid database. And then you know things like basic counts and selects and joins and transactions that you know or have no chance of modifying the database, you send those to the replicas. And so you can have as many replicas as you want. 
you got to be careful because at some point you can't have you know a thousand replicas hitting some poor transaction lock because there's still only one transaction lock. But the idea of read-only replicas released the need to completely scale the master database for the reads, and 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 there could be brief moments of inconsistency, but away you go. Now, in a way, this shows we'll see how this becomes kind of the modern hybrid architecture because this is already a blend of acid and base because these replicas are ever so slightly potentially inconsistent. Multi-master is another kind of thing where you have two master databases but because the master databases has the responsibility of sort of putting this block on all transactions on the way until the transaction in flight really completes there's a lot of coordination between the masters and so people have this and there but it's really a compromise because the need to send every lock and every row and everything that might modify ever to all of them to say here comes x i just got a thing to x and you got to stop all x's and so you so that combination of two master databases has got to be able to coordinate well enough to make it from the outside world you can't ever have consistency now of course you can you can have this multi-masker. Now each master has a new trans has a transaction log. They got to talk to each other's transaction logs, and they got to re read replicas. So multi-master is something that people have used at times, but usually it's not a really good solution because of so much coordination between the masters. At some point, it's better just to have a bigger master. The other common thing is uh, multiple store types. So things like um, profile pictures in a blogging system or a uploaded picture. You know, you don't really want to put that in database. Databases are fine at storing pictures. They're signed at storing blobs. You can put PDFs or QuickTime movies in a database. But it turns out that it just kind of, for the database backups. And so you tend to say, you know what, for the blobs, for the large files that I'm going to deal with, I'm gonna have them on some kind of a shared file system because that's our mostly, that's such a read mostly kind of a thing. And so you just kind of have a hybrid where you just say, you know, I'm gonna have a database table called the where are the files and then I'm gonna have a file system that has files. And in the example I'm using, you're seeing sort of hashed names. Uh, it's common to uh, come up with what's a, called a single instance data store where you actually read the entire file and come up with a SHA-1 or some other hash of the file and use that as the index. And then you can actually have multiple virtual files in your relational database that point to the same physical file. But then when you're actually going to serve the physical file, like a QuickTime movie or a PDF or a JPEG, you just use the standard open. You open it, you read it, and you send the bytes out to the browser or whatever it is. Now you're, you're deciding how to store all this stuff inside your application. There's no SQL that kind of figures this out that automatically says, oh, it's a, it's a big blob, so I'm going to do it completely differently. The ACID databases do often store it differently. The problem is, is things like backup can be uh, problematic. And so it's nice to have, with this kind of a multiple store type, it's nice to have an independent backup between your relational system and your file system, just because the, uh, especially if you're storing your files based on some kind of a hash, uh, the, the backup is really beautifully simple for a file system and the backup is a little harder for, me, for an ACID style relational databases. So multiple store types. There's also what I'll call a multi-tenant pretend cloud. I'm a cloud vendor but I really don't have a cloud application and so what they have is one bunch of application code and then they have little tiny single instance relational databases, one for each client and then they say overall we got like a thousand clients but you also have like a thousand databases. And that's not, it's not a bad architecture. It's actually, it's a beautiful architecture in that it lets you have a single application for lots of clients, but then um, it's not a real, it's not, the fact that it might have scaled to 10 million, well, no, it just scaled a bunch of different 80,000, you know, how many, 100,000, it just, there's a hundred, 100,000 person things and now it's 10 million, but it's not really 10 million. So this, I'll call this, pretend cloud. It's not a cloud scale application. It is just a multi-tenant application that is conveniently architected to look like a cloud application. And so if we look at this and you look at sort of uh, how applications, let's just imagine email. This is a map of higher education institutions. And so you could think of email. Uh, relational databases were really good at 
you know, handling things between 1,000 and a quarter of a million. And so you could imagine an email system with all the students and the alumni, quarter of a million, half a million, maybe. And so you got a good relational database, you'd buy some hardware and you size the hardware for that database and the database grows slowly because we're only going to pull in, you know, 15,000 new students a year. So it, life was good, right? Because these are all separate databases. And in that kind of fake cloud where they're all separate databases, they're all the same. These might all be customers of one company and, and you know, one cloud vendor of email, but really there's just one database for each of these and they're still got a quarter of a million or less folks. And this is this is the world in which acid-based relational databases evolved, is handling, let's just say, a quarter of a million or less. A quarter of a million was a big instance, right? And if you, But if you could handle a quarter of a million, like Oracle and Postgres and MySQL, then we can use you for the kind of thing, because we had all these separate little databases. And so that's the state of databases in 2002. And up next, we're going to talk about like what disrupted this, and that is the first generation real cloud applications. <laughs>